Adam Smith was on track. He has no idea what he's talking about. Because Adam Smith believes that the only thing that actually adds value is human effort. But that fundamental presumption makes humans machines, it makes the earth our slave, it makes the ecosystem essentially an expendable. And that hasn't worked. are part of a big system. And by the way, not limited to Earth. We're part of an enormous system. And if we take all of the energy that's available to us in that system and say, let's not harness it and capture it, let's put ourselves in the flow of possibilities of right now is super profound. In this very moment, in this precise moment, we, and by that I mean literally you and I, have not a possibility, we have a certainty of being able to tell a story that has been so long forgotten on this planet that it's just an echo in the consciousness of a few. So across the last several thousand years, there's been a, quite an alarming just kind of genetic trend. And the genetic trend as a species has been warring tribes come onto each other. And the first thing they do is they round up the intellectuals, they round up the spiritual, they round up the people who are really at the vanguard of culture and kill them. And then the warring occupier actually decides to, in conquest, procreate with the conquered. And I would argue that what we've done is hybridized ourselves as a species into a lesser state, not a higher state. We've killed off the wild type in the genome. And so I think one of the things that I see is a hybridization, if you will, of a humanity that has actually been trained not to open to its higher purpose. And it's been encouraged not to with the narratives that we tell each other. So what I see we are, is I see we are a lot of sleeping potential, where an enormous amount of what we have the capacity to do is actually encouraged by many systems not to awaken. And I see my purpose, very specifically, as being an alarm clock in that universe to say, hey, let's wake up to our full potential. Let's wake up to who we can be. I think people are experiencing the dissonance or what Greg Bateson referred to as the double bind. They see a reality around them which is filled with natural beauty and wonder. They see whales and see icebergs. They see the things around them that are really quite spectacular. And they see an order that underlies that, and it seems to make sense. Glaciers calve, and then 
there's more snow and then there's something about it that seems to make sense and we see flowers opening and we see food being produced and we see so many things that seem to work. And then when we look at the mirror of humanity, we go, it doesn't seem like we're actually playing along that same system. Are we actually part of this thing or are we somehow separated from it? And that opens up some very painful spaces for people to try to explore. And most people will choose to avoid the pain of that exploration because the possibility exists that maybe we're doing this to ourselves. And we simply do not want to confront the possibility that maybe at the end of the day, we're responsible for why we don't look like we're isomorphic with the reality around us. So the essence of humanity starts with this. And let's just work our way through this story. In passion and in crazy love and in all kinds of really weird contorted ways, two beings actually come together. And this half genetic code over here and this half genetic code over here actually decide to do something really profound. They actually decide to get together. And if you see this under a microscope, it's really cool to see because there's a little dance going on. And then all of a sudden, these things kind of line up. We call them chromosomes. And these chromosomes line up and they kind of dance a bit. And you can see them do this and this and this. The ancients actually knew what this was. This was auspiciousness. This was the cell lining up with all of the fields of the universe. And in this moment of this first divide, boom, the first sets of cells, and then the next sets of cells, we were imprinted with all of the energy of the universe in the first ordinate divide. The first moment that the first cell decided to first divide, we got our clue as to who we are and why we're here. And by the way, every part of us got it. Our cells got it, our ecosystem got it, the earth got it, the cosmos got it. They got we're here. And then this really cool thing happens and all of a sudden four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, boom, 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 boom. And before long, you've got ears and you've got fingers and you've got a heart and you've got all of this stuff. And every replication of each one of those divides preserves in it the memory of the first ordinate alignment where all the energy of the universe aligned with the agreement to say life. So what's a human? What a human is, is the imprint of all of the energy of the cosmos that has the capacity to manifest on this earth. And it is only through our forgetting of that journey. It's only through the forgetting of that path. It's only through the defiling of it that we actually lose the genius of the universe. I never fell asleep. I remember it all. And I didn't know that I was in a position that was rather unique, at least in my ecosystem, until I found out how many people were sleeping. And it is an amazingly lonely and painful journey to actually see something that others apparently forgot. I have looked at children many times and I puzzle over why it is that people who call themselves adults try to erase what we dismiss as imagination, what we dismiss as dreams, what we dismiss as all of the things that children have just bursting out of them. Why is it that an imaginary friend has to be imaginary because we don't see them? Why is it that sitting down and 
getting into a cardboard box and it's become a spaceship. Why, why is that something we have to say, no, stop, stop playing with that box and start playing with this electric powered toy that I gave you? Why, why is it that we have this impulse to extinguish the possibility we see in children? And my argument is that we have so much pain around falling asleep because we know that we did it that it is actually painful for us to see a world in which a two-year-old can speak to a dead grandmother. That concept is something that's so deeply enculturated, and it's very important to say it is not our native state. This is a state that we create. This is not our native state, because our native state still has imaginary friends that are real, still has the possibility of space travel and time travel and all of those shapes and all of those dimensions. And we still have that somewhere inside and the pain we have of saying, you must conform to my sleeping state. Because if you actually stay awake and you keep that state moving forward, you could be very disruptive to a system of sleepers. So for me, the principle of God, the principle of divine is very simple. I know that there is something in me that can encounter something that is bigger or outside of me, that actually leads me to bow my knees in absolute wonderment and gratitude and awe. There's a connection somewhere that I can encounter something where I'm so deeply impacted and so deeply overwhelmed that my only response is to literally fall down and just be amazingly grateful. For me, that's what I think people describe as God. Now the question and the philosophical debate about some embodiment of God, whatever that embodiment is, is one that I view very much like I view colors of a beach ball. If I'm sitting and I'm looking at a beach ball and I happen to see the red panel, for me the ball is red. If I move around the ball and I walk to the white panel, then for me that ball is a white ball. And most people in their lives get a chance to maybe see the margin mostly red but a little white. Sometimes people actually put themselves on a plane and go to a place that's very different from the place that they grew up in. And they go from a red panel to a green panel. And they go, wow, these people seem to be like me, but they have different names for things. And it turns out that a few of us have actually been able to fly far enough away to see a beach ball. Now, I've seen the beach ball. And what I know about the beach ball is it doesn't require naming because that divinity is bigger than any name, any language. It's bigger than it all. And is in fact constantly inviting us to actually step in one step further, one step further, one step further into that infinitely orthogonal space. And when we get there, guess what we meet? We meet it all. My dear friend Anil Gupta in India had a very interesting experience with me. We were sitting in a cab, and to the left of us, there was a beggar. And the beggar had his legs mostly disease-ridden, his arms amputated, mostly gone. And he was sitting holding a can inside of, his, inside of his armpit, begging on the street. And as that was going on, 
a limousine pulled up beside me on the other side. And I looked at Anil and I said to him, I don't know how you live here. I don't know how you can live with such stark contrast and actually not just be torn to pieces. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, David, that's proof that there's a God. And I said, no, as a matter of fact, my view is that that's the proof that if there was one, he has left the building. And he smiled and he said, no, no, no. He said, it's proof there's a God. I said, okay, unpack that for me. And what he said was this. He said, if you interviewed everybody who drove, th drove through this intersection, he said, almost all of them would have either seen the beggar or they would have seen the limousine. But he said most of them may not have even seen either one of them. They would have been so caught up in their own day, traffic, whatever else, that they wouldn't have paid attention to either one. He said the proof that there's a God for me is that you saw both. He said because divine only lets you see what you can do something about. That was one of those things that cut so deeply to the core of who I am as a person. Because what I realized is that it's very easy for me to see a situation and go, why isn't someone doing something? And I would go as far as to say that this is a truth of the universe. And I don't use truth very often, but I think that if I was going to use it, this would be one of the places that I would. I think that if we perceive or we see, we make a mistake if we don't see it as an invitation, almost an order to act. This is not a perception for the benefit of becoming the guy who orders people around and says, hey, go do this, go do this. No, if we perceive that there is something to do, that perception is our invitation to say to, to that situation, the universe has given me the discernment and the perspective that says act, and, and this is the critical piece, and it trusted me in this moment with everything that's necessary to take the first step. Now the first step is just that, it's the first step. But if you take that step, and you trust that that step is going to not only be taken once, but it's going to be taken again and again and again, I know, and this is something I know, I don't believe, that following that step is constantly provisioned. So it's really cool if you let yourself fall into the river of purpose, that river of purpose will take you to its destination and you don't have to be filled with effort and strife and conflict to get there because the river knows where it's going. Yeah, so we probably got here officially by a papal edict by Pope Innocent III. Pope Innocent III, when he was trying to finance the Crusades, decided that it was time to co-opt religion into a tax framework. So it was the first time that it was legal in the church to tax and to charge interest and to do all the things that historically had been considered to be inappropriate. And he did it because he needed to pay for a war. So. I mean, he was obviously divinely inspired, but what he really needed was a way to pay for a war. From Pope Innocent III to the Italians who had this very perverse marriage to the sea in which the Venetian merchants and others would wed themselves to the sea and they would actually take an oath, a matrimonial oath, that says that I, the man, have dominion over you, the sea. Right, which even saying it is ludicrous. I mean, all you have to do is be out on a boat and you can find out who has dominion over who, right? But that's not what happened. What happened was there was a culture built around we have dominion over. And dominion is the root, is the root of how we've defiled humanity and the earth. Because by the time we get to Adam Smith, Adam Smith goes all the way down to the raw materials. That term, by the way, doesn't exist before we start going into the industrial space. Raw material is matter and energy. And because during the 18th century and a little bit of the 17th century, the view was we as beings have dominion over everything and therefore everything is inanimate 
is subject to our disposal, etc. He made the statement that all matter and energy, all resources, are in fact zero cost. And that the march of industry is about the cost of extraction, which is human effort, the cost of refining, the cost of processing, the cost of value add. And he actually did something which was far more insidious because in his treatise, The Wealth of Nations, he went one step further to say that humans who are laborers are in fact also a resource. He dehumanized the workforce. So 1776 actually sets in motion not only the carnage we've done to the environment, but it actually set in motion the carnage we've done to ourselves. And we have this really sick view of humanity that was born with Adam Smith in the entire industrial age. And by the way, none of this has changed. We still speak of children as the cost of having a child. We still speak in terms that if we actually entered into the humanity or the inhumanity of what we're saying, we would find revolting. See, what Adam Smith did was he said that everything has the option of being abused to the point of extinction and that value is only defined when humans manifest effort over that thing. So what does that do? That means that matter and energy, that means production, that means all of these things must require, first of all, human effort. We can't accept with gratitude that which just is. We can't see as valuable that which just is. This rock, these rocks, the penguins, these must not have value. Why? Because there's no human effort that went into them. And by the way, a mine doesn't have value until we've dug it out of the ground. Why is it that a vein of gold, which is known and measured and assayed, why is it that it has to be taken out of the ground to be stored in the ground in a vault? Those are the questions we're not even invited to ask. We're not invited to ask that because clearly, for gold to have value, I have to take a ton of overburden, listen to the language, a ton of overburden, I have to crush that overburden into gravel. I have to leach and process that overburden to extract the one ounce of gold that I might get out of that ton of overburden. And now the ore body is what? Waste. No, it was a mountain yesterday. And it was a mountain that actually held life and vibrancy and was a place where trees grew and where people had ceremonies and actual real things got done. But that's not what we're talking about. We're actually talking about saying it has to come out of the ground to have value. And the trouble with that mentality is that we actually can't think a different way. We presume that if it's not in a package, if it can't be consumed, it must not have value. And by having that mentality energetically we push away nature, we push away each other and we say, I'm sorry, I'd love to help you if you could pay your fee. There are moments in time where the impulse that comes from inside of me says that if you defiled it with money, I'd have a problem. But how do we make a living? Listen to that. How do we make a living? Living. Adam Smith corrupted something as simple as living because we have to make a living. Why? Because it must be human effort. It must be human endeavor. We can't even say yes to ourselves. So we adopt a language that says we have to make a living. We say these words. We embody this pathology and then we ask ourselves, how do we transform? And the fact of the matter is, we cannot transform into a reality we cannot even imagine. And imagining reality says, let's start with, how about we don't make livings? How about we live?
Adam Smith gave us the curse of extinction. And what we're interested in opening up is the blessing of living. The way you're talking, it's like we imprisoned ourselves in an idea. Yes, we did. What I think we've done is I think we've become our own slaves. And I think we've shackled ourselves with the cunning use of language. I think what we've done is we've built the epistemology of the oppressed. And what we've done in that epistemology is we've built this framework that says, let's use words that reinforce the catechism that says that we, in fact, are trapped. Because obviously, we're not trapping ourselves. But the language we use and the terms that we use and the experiences that we manufacture in fact reinforce the very illusion that is one of separation, one of indenture. And we don't have the language to talk about what it would be to live in a world where the fullness of potential is actually always being called forth. So what's possible? What's possible is to say, can I adopt a language that says that I am not going to enter into the reinforcement of those illusions, but rather I'm going to step into a space where my life, my objective, is in fact a sovereign memory of the first imprint of the universe. And everything about me and everything about how I show up is only going to tire when I look up in the sky and there's no more stars. When I look across a vista and there are no more mountains, when I sit outside and there are no more snowflakes. And until then, I'm not done. Because as long as the persistent system of the universe is going, I'm going. Because I, in fact, am one with that persistent universe. I went to Rabaul, Papua New Guinea, and I stood under an erupting volcano. And as the eruption ash, hot ash fell, little pebbles fell, and then the cold ash that had gone up and become precipitation came down in this gray black mud. Cold, beautiful, cold mud. So I was hot ash, little pebbles, cold, chilly mud. That's all hitting my body. And in the moment of observing, that ash fall, I asked myself the following question. What would it be like to open up a space where you as a human welcomed the earth for the first time? And I was overcome with tears and emotion. And my tears and mud just streamed down my body as I stood there. And I actually was welcoming the earth to humans. You can't imagine how profound that is. Because if you can enter into a consciousness where you can have the audacity to be human, the capacity to say to the earth, welcome, welcome. You're my friend. You're my home. Welcome. Others can look at the same thing and say, natural disaster. But when the coconut washes ashore and puts its little roots into that fresh volcanic ash, and a year or two years later there's a tree, wasn't it the case that it wasn't a natural disaster? Wasn't it the case that maybe we stopped dancing with nature in a way to allow nature to dance back with us? because somehow or another the coconut figured that out. Do you see the way we're treating the planet right now as the end result of that way of thinking? Oh, there's no, there's no question that 
how we show up on the world now is one where we've reinforced our dominion illusions, we've reinforced Adam Smith's mandate that human effort is required to make value happen, we've reinforced a number of these things, and then we've built entire systems to celebrate it. See, everything that we're doing right now is reinforcing the imprisonment, the tyranny of that oppression that we put on ourselves. And if an abuser feels that they are trapped in a pattern, then what they do is they actually find something that they perceive to be beneath them and heighten the abuse. So if I'm an adult and I can abuse a child, and then the child has something to look for to abuse down, and what we do is we put together this, this hierarchy that says, I'm an abuser up here, I feel abused, so I'm gonna take less thought for the next thing below me and the next thing below me, and we create this hierarchy that says, I'm gonna take advantage of something. To the point where the earth winds up being the tyranny of last resort, which is, and ultimately, since we humans have dominion over, therefore, earth loses. The problem with our ecosystem conversation is we're willfully living in ignorance because our models only work when we haven't accounted for the all-in cost of our own actions. Because if we actually accounted for the all-in cost of our actions, we would do different actions. And that's not what we want. We want to do socially acceptable, in our context, different actions paying no attention to the actual implications of that in other ecosystems. So the ecosystem is it all. And it all is all. It's cosmos, it's air, it's wind, weather, it's earth, it's trees, it's plants, it's animals, it's us, it's all of it, all, all. That's our ecosystem. But, the ecosystem of imposition is typically the space most people find very comfortable to live in. They're very comfortable living without the knowledge of the all, all cost. We don't spend any time thinking about the fact that to get a can of Coke refrigerated in Sydney is a 328% inefficient process. Let's follow the thread. I take this black sludgy stuff out of the ground using energy, which by the way, on the best of days is about 40% efficient. Then I take that stuff and I shove it through a pipe losing about 10% efficiency moving through the pipe. And then I go through a refining process that blows through an enormous amount of energy to refine it, which ultimately leads me over 100% inefficient from where it was in the ground. And then I put it in a tanker and I run the tanker across the ocean. Hopefully it doesn't spill. And I get it to a depot where I can take that oil off the ship and then I decide to burn it. So some of it escapes. And, and I burn it to, to heat up water. Are you ready for this? To heat up water, to drive a turbine, to actually spin the turbine, which now I'm already at over 200% efficiency loss. I get to there and then I actually jack, jack this giant thing called an electrical turbine that sends current up into a distribution line, that line goes across miles and miles and miles, losing energy all the way, then it gets to the socket in my house, and then it goes through an outlet into a refrigerator where I do what? I heat up a copper coil to cool my Coke can. Is it possible? Is it conceivable that that's stupid? Is it conceivable that I may be able to take a step back and say, could I achieve a cold can of Coke without all of that happening? And if I ask that question, is it conceivable that maybe I wouldn't want to drink a can of Coke in the first place? Is it conceivable that I might actually want a glass of water?
Charity is a byproduct of insensitivity and horrific greed and abuse. What it is, is the after tax of the absence of consciousness. If we were aware of the actions that we are taking, and if we were aware of the all-in consequence that those actions require, we would actually start by saying, how do we move through the entire system of our engagement with the world without defiling anything? That means looking at the people who live on the land where we're gonna extract the minerals from the mine, looking at the conditions under which that extraction is going to happen. If what we do is we actually look at the continuum of the process and understand each step of that process, we would be able to build systems that say, let's make sure that people are educated about land management and stewardship. Let's make sure that people are respected if they're asked to engage in their land in a particular way. Let's make sure there's education, health care. Let's make sure that there's food and provisioning. Let's make sure there's shelter. Let's make sure that family units are kept together. You see where this is going. What happens is, if I'm conscious about the entire arc of this, and I build it into the actual cost of my engagement, then I get to the end and charity has no purpose. Charity is a direct consequence of our failure to engage with consciousness at the beginning. And we, as civilization, do a shitty job of buying back our souls. We make pathetic expressions of humanity. We try to reinforce that through a guilt process. We try to do all of those things. But charity, as long as it exists, is proof that we have not consciously engaged our ecosystem. Because the moment we do that, there will be no person who is left behind. There will be no part of the earth that we neglect and abuse. We will in fact make a conscious decision that says if it comes at the cost of life, if it comes at the cost of species, if it comes at the cost of land and elegance and beauty, whatever the widget is that we think we're gonna make isn't worth that cost. And we as humanity can consciously engage in a way that doesn't mean that we defile only to try to repair. We can actually live in a way that doesn't require defiling in the first place. If we move from a statement of dominion over to the other conditions that are available, one could very easily see ourselves in a conversation similar to one I had with Jan de Dude at Rabobank in the Netherlands. I spoke to Jan about the, the possibility that in a bank you have a bunch of different companies that seek credit. And I asked Jan, why is it that the bank has a chief risk officer? What does it say? about humanity if you have a chief risk officer. But you don't have any officers about people actually fulfilling their obligations, honoring their commitments. Like you don't have a chief integrity officer, you don't have a chief people are gonna pay off their debt off. You don't have any of those, but you have a chief risk officer. What does that message send? What's possible if we move out of the paradigm we're in and move to another paradigm where we're not in dominion over, but we're actually understanding ourselves in context with. Let's go back to that first cell that first divided. We are the organization of matter and energy. If we are the organization of matter and energy, if that's what we are, then we could see ourselves as entirely covalently bonded to purpose. And I'm meaning that in precisely the language I'm using, covalently bonded to purpose. We, by virtue of our birth, by virtue of our existence, are actually a molecular union with the earth. As such, we have utility. We have the ability to be part of a stewardship cycle that can promote and advance and make an impact 
or we can spend our lives seeking to separate. But if we covalently bind ourselves to that which gave us our being, then all of a sudden we see ourselves entirely as an inseparable whole. Now this is not about dominion over. One hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom and oxygen atom getting together. Don't decide. Water today, not so much tomorrow. We are covalent bonds. We are covalent bonds. We are covalent bonds. And the only reason why we would violate that principle is because somewhere along the line we were told that separation, scarcity, limitation was imposed and should be imposed on and by us. And my radical idea is or not. That's it. That's how radical it is. Maybe the marriage to the sea. Maybe Adam Smith. Maybe Charles Darwin. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe they had their perspective. Fair enough. That was their perspective. And maybe we can consider a different perspective where we in fact are covalently engaged with the universe. When we wake up to the possibilities that are always around us and when we fall into the loving embrace of abundance, we won't use the word entrepreneur anymore. And we won't use that word because that word, like industrialist, that word, like laborer, is a word that defines separation. We won't label people as a thing. We will actually label people as people. So there's not going to be a term entrepreneur, just like there's not going to be a term secretary or chief executive officer or anything else. What we're going to do is we're going to revert into verbs. What are we doing? What's the doer nature of who you are? What is the manifesting nature of what you are? So even our terminology will change. That will be, by the way, one of the signals of the awakening that we'll stop having to point at things and objectify things. We'll actually just engage things. So that, that's gonna be one of the early indicators. But what's fascinating is what is emerging is a reality around this principle of maybe the is nature of things is where we should focus, is we're a better place to live. And so what's possible is to take a lesson from a flower. But what a flower does is a flower recognizes that it's part of an ecosystem and part of that ecosystem means that it needs to make itself available in an aesthetic beautiful way so that by expressing itself it attracts other forms of life to it and by attracting other forms of life to it those other life forms actually have the ability to extract from the flower certain value, respite, security, sanctuary, food, a place to enjoy the just the aesthetic beauty. And in the doing of that, the flower receives the essential pollination that actually persists and regenerates the next year's flower. The interesting thing is the prayer of the flower, if you will, is make me so compellingly beautiful that the hummingbird and that the butterfly and that the bee actually find themselves a place to land on me. Spread the petals as far open as possible. 
Let every bit of light reflect off every surface of who I am, hide nothing. And in that moment, I have the capacity to invite other life to participate, engage, and benefit for whose benefit? See, the flower knows. The flower knows that there's no time. Because benefit is to everything in the system. And as a human, I can take a step back and I can watch all this happen. And I can look at it and I can say that this is not some remote possibility. This is not about a future. This is not about something that could happen if humanity got the right self-help book. This is about looking at the way in which reality actually plays out and saying, I bet that if we actually built our playbook around that model, we might have a game worth playing. So rather than looking at a world where we're bringing the energy of scarcity which drives our need to survive, our need to quote make a living, we're actually not doing that anymore. We're actually looking at the thing we're doing and understand the context in which we're engaging and go, hey, is this really reinforcing who I am and what I bring to this planet? I can, in fact, engage where I am covalently linked to the ecosystem that gave me my existence. And I am linked to that in a way that says, let me honor and pay homage to every bit of that system and let me do everything I can to do what I can do and ultimately what I can influence to make that possibility propagate as far and as wide as possible. And before long, hundreds and thousands of organizations and companies and endeavors are getting together and what they're doing is actually looking at the human condition, looking at the condition of the earth, looking at the condition of the ecosystem that we've influenced and start saying maybe it's time that we re-engage ourselves and say, let's not do that again. Let's actually engage with meaning and purpose. Let's commit ourselves to engaging with meaning and purpose. And let's make it our solemn vow that we, in fact, will tell the story of where we were so that we have the capacity to stay on track for where we're going. The world is fine. It's fine. It's beautiful. It dances, does all the cool things it does. The world's great. Humanity has the possibility of dancing back again to greatness. The state of the world right now, with respect to how humanity is showing up, is humanity is actually not showing up. We're not doing all we can do, and we can do more, and we are invited constantly to do more. Where we are in this very moment is a space in the broad arc of the human narrative of asking the question, are we going to allow that genotype that we carry to express itself in the beautiful mutagenicity that wakens possibility, wakens new creativity, wakens all of these things that are around us. Are we willing to let that genotype express itself? Or are we going to continue to poison ourselves and toxify ourselves and sedate ourselves and just totally disarm that possibility such that we're now in a state where we just stay asleep? The risk we have is not extinction. The risk we have is persistent boredom. We can go to this monotonous space where we kind of revert to some form of pond scum or algae and get along and just kind of muck our way through things. And we can probably do that. 
out of the pond scum one day, something might evolve. And it may come back in a form that actually knows how to fall in love with the beauty and the body that it represents. I would like us to at least consider the possibility that we don't have to wait for that. There's a possibility that by having new conversations and by having the ability to actually open up new insights, new perspectives, by placing ourselves in that more rich environment, we may be able to activate ourselves such that we can be a compelling alternative to those who are choosing the path of sleeping. And I think, and I think that that's in fact what we're doing here. I think when we get on a boat, we travel to the Antarctic Circle, we come back, we have phenomenal conversations, we have deeply intimate exchanges with others. I think that the possibility says that if we take one or two or three and just start unleashing a new narrative in those, then those narratives will then spread and spread and spread and before long what we'll find is that we're sitting in this phenomenal space of possibility that can open in front of us and literally in these moments we have the best shot at getting humanity back into humans. <laughs>